hello to everyone. I think I've met many of you uh, and a lot of familiar faces, so it's good to be here. Um, it's an unenviable position to be right after lunch on the second day. People are tired or hungover, so uh, we're gonna have a lot of uh, interaction here. So um, if you have questions, you can stop me. We don't have to have questions at the end. Um, but what I'm gonna be talking about today is SAS analytics uh, and SAS metrics that you need to watch and those that you don't. Because uh, I think anybody running a SaaS business, which I guess, show of hands, who runs a SaaS or subscription business? Awesome, good for you. Uh, and who tracks their metrics like every day, every week, every month? Cool, okay, we're gonna talk about all this. Um, so that's cool, SaaS metrics are fun. Um, there we go, but it's the second day right after lunch, and so what's really cool is how we can grow our companies faster by paying attention to our metrics, because uh, metrics by themselves aren't really that important. Um, so who, again, show of hands, who's happy with their current growth rate? Who has a positive growth rate? I guess we'll start with that, yep. And who's happy with it? Right on, cool, I did, that's not unexpected, okay. Um, after your talk earlier, cool. So, um, so I think what we're gonna say here is like, instead of just this nebulous, I need to grow and I wanna grow my business, let's put some values around this, some metrics and narrow down this whole huge field of like marketing and sustainability to something that's a little more uh, tangible and that we can affect better. So uh, my son just started judo, he's seven. Uh, this is not my son, but uh, I think you know, this, uh, this Bruce Lee quote is really cool because it dispels like the arrival fallacy, right? The arrival fallacy is that when I get to 10K and I can quit my day job, then I'm there, or when I have a team of 10 people and I don't have to be working in the business every day, I can work on the business, that everything will be sunshine and rainbows and unicorns. Uh, and it's not true, right? Because you're never there, right? We're all at this conference because we want more out of our businesses and this fulfillment that it gives us personally. Uh, and I think, talking about metrics, it's the same thing. We are never going to be there. We're never gonna be happy. And so you just have to get cool and comfortable with being unhappy and, and, and kind of run your business this way. So who has seen something like this in all the marketing world? Yep, cool. Uh, top of funnel, middle of funnel, bottom of funnel. Uh, the idea is you just get a bunch of people aware of your brand and your content and then you work them through this funnel by educating them about the problem that your product solves. Uh, and then hopefully, oh, is this not working? Okay. Everybody hear me okay? Cool. Um, I'm like double, double fist in here. Um, and then convert them at the bottom of the funnel. And, and so this, this works really well. This is pretty traditional. I think some people are starting to dispel this a little bit with like instead of funnels, they're using loops and cycles. Um, but the idea is really that you, you start kind of at the top with something like awareness and then increase uh, kind of awareness of like a problem and then the solution that your, problem, your product presents, and more information about your product itself and how it's different from others, and then hopefully convert these visitors or trial users into paying customers at the end. We're gonna to touch on this down here a lot more later, but this is uh, something that's really popular in the marketing world these days about the five stages of like the customer journey. So I think that this model is kind of uh, short-sighted, right, as business owners. If you're a marketer, then this is cool, right, because this is all you care about. But as a business owner, this tells, like, from a metrics perspective, maybe half of the story. And what I really like to break it down to is acquisition and retention, um, because they're the two parts of the business. One is getting people kind of into your world and into your funnel, and then converting them, and then <laughs> you gotta keep them around, right, because there's a very pop, I'm part of the Tiny Seed cohort, we have a very famous saying now from one of the, the Tiny Seed folks, Einar, that he says, I hate your churn. Uh, and because churn will absolutely wreck your business, right? And so Einar hates everyone's churn, even if it's really low, like we're fortunate to have at Castos. Um, you have to pay attention to both sides is the point, right? You have to pay attention to awareness and acquisition and trials and all this good stuff, but you also pay attention to things like lifetime value and churn. And we'll talk about both sides of this because they're really important. Um, so from an acquisition metrics perspective, this is like the world, right? <laughs> this is like all we really care about. Uh, so you have things like 
from the very top of the funnel, number of people come to your website, right? And, and, and the way we like to think about this is, is we'll talk about, you know, kind of how we evaluate our metrics and how we can change them in the future. Um, but just the very beginning is like, how many people are coming to your website? From there, it kind of goes down the funnel to say, like, how many trials do you have started? That's cool. And then what's that ratio? So what is the trial to visitor ratio in your business or for your funnel? And then from there, you say, how many new paying customers do I have every month or whatever? Uh, and we, we talk about that in terms of MRR usually. Uh, and then what's that trial to paid conversion ratio? Important. Uh, and then something else that we, we think about is like how much does that cost, right? How much do we spend on AdWords or Facebook ads or a marketing person or content writers? All super important because you can't be paying more to acquire a customer than they're worth um, in the long run. And then the last one, which is super hard, but uh, if you can figure it out, is channel attribution. So where are you getting people from? And then how much does that cost uh, from each channel? On the, re on the retention side of things, that's kind of like after someone becomes a paying customer, how long did they stay around? So we talk about revenue churn, we talk about customer lifetime value, uh, and average revenue per user. So on a monthly basis, how much does the average person pay you? And then the big one is cash in the bank. Um, because all, at the end of the day, that's all of it. Right? All this is really about is like how profitable is your business, how sustainable is it? And so what we don't want to happen is this. And that's why I like to think about acquisition and retention, because you don't want to put a bunch of resources and time and money and stuff in the top of the funnel or in the top of the bucket just for it to leak out the bottom. Uh, and so we're going to run through a couple of examples, and I'll ask your opinion on kind of, you know, hey, look, let's look at this business. Is this good or is this bad? Um, but the way that we kind of solidify this is with a scorecard. Uh, and this is not my unique idea. This is from a book called Traction by Gina Wickman. Who's read Traction? So there's two Traction books. Rob talked about one yesterday. It's not the marketing book. It's the how to run a business book. Yep. Everyone else should read it. Like this week. It's, it's the book on how to run a business. Uh, from a really kind of macro. It's like if you've read the E-Myth, it's like the E-Myth 2. They already got the E-Myth 2.0. It's the E-Myth 3.0. Uh, it's like for grown-ups, how we should run our business. So he has this idea of like a scorecard. Everything that really matters in your business is too much for all of us to think about, so you solidify it down and concentrate it into one piece of paper, and it's your scorecard. So it's all of these SaaS metrics, and then for the business as a whole, it's things like cash in the bank and receivables and all this kind of stuff. Depending on your business, your scorecard will change, but you have to have a place to look at this on a regular basis that's easily accessible and that you can track over time. So how and where do we track our metrics? So uh, a lot of subscription folks in here will use something like Profit Weller by Metrics. That's cool. That's a piece of it. Something like Google Analytics, also super important, amazingly free. Uh, and then a product usage tool like Amplitude, Mixpanel. There's a handful of others out there, Heap. Uh, and then we got to put all this information somewhere. So we put it in things like Notion, which is what we use for like our, our communication tool. Uh, or in Basecamp or in Google Sheets or Google Drive. So how often to track your metrics? Uh, there are definitely people who look at ProfitWell every day. I am Craig. I look at ProfitWell every day. I obsess about it. Um, and that's cool. You should. You should look at some things every day. You should look at some things every week. And you should look at some things every month, I think. Uh, and so we'll talk about what we do. Uh, and you can kind of take this for what it's worth. Um, so on a monthly basis, we write a, and we did this before we joined Tiny Seed, we write a kind of narrative, a letter to our friends and advisors and people that I know and respect in the space, and now we write it to Rob and Einar and the folks at Tiny Seed to say, hey, this is how we're doing. Uh, and we include all of this stuff in that letter uh, and say, here's our MRR, here's our churn, here's our ARPU, here's our LPV, here's our CAC, here's the number of new trials that we'd started. Um, on a monthly basis, because these are kind of lagging indicators, right? You're not going to go do something. I guess James uh, talked, dispelled this a little bit. You're not going to go do something that uh, affects churn on like a weekly basis, right? This is a longer term thing to affect these numbers. So that's why you only report these once a month, because if you looked at churn or ARPU on a weekly basis, you'd be like, yep, it's the same as it was last week if your business is anything like mine. On a weekly basis, we look at a lot of the marketing and acquisition type things. So we look at website visitors, new trials, what that ratio is, trial to paid conversion ratio. Um, and we try to look at channel attribution because these are things that are really fluid and dynamic and are changing hopefully all the time. Right? If you have an active marketing group, 
uh, all of this stuff should be changing all the time. So we track this, I'll show you how, in a Google Sheet, and we look at it all the time. Um, and hopefully these numbers are changing on a weekly basis, that tells us that something is happening, and hopefully that's good. Um, and then on a daily basis, we look at basically profit wealth. Um, we look at how many new trials we had started yes yesterday, we look at what our MRR is today, and we look at the number of new paying customers we acquired since the last time we looked, which is yesterday. And so you might be saying, Craig, sounds like a pain, right? Um, but it doesn't have to be, right? So we, uh, we automate a lot of this. Tools like ProfitWell automatically do a lot of this for you. Thank you, Patrick. Um, but for the, the, the really marketing kind of metrics, there's not a tool other than Google Analytics that does this in a really cool way. Um, like Data Studio from Google, I think, makes this in a really nice format. Um, but we do is we automate the collection of all this into a Google Sheet with a free add-on for Google Sheets. Everyone should be taking a picture of this because it's amazing. Uh, so you install this add-on for Google Sheets that pulls automatically select Google Analytics reports into a Google Sheet for you so you don't have to go into Google Analytics all the time to look at your stuff. And so this is kind of a screenshot of what this looks like. Uh, we have a couple of things here like users. This is unique website visitors. And then we have two goals in our business. One is uh, when somebody starts a new trial and then when they become a paying customer, and these are custom goals in Google Analytics that we've set up. And so it pulls this into a spreadsheet that I gave the first version of this to Denise on our team, and it was horrible, and she made it very pretty like this. And this is, these are our metrics from the last month or so. And I don't have to do anything. I just have this, this Google Sheet bookmarked in Chrome, and I go look at it once a week right before her and I have our one-on-one -on -one call. And so I look at this and I say, great. This is working, this isn't working, this is where we should focus our efforts. This thing we just started is awesome, let's do more of it. Um, and so we start doing this. Who knows this? Folks from the US maybe know this. I don't know if this exists in Europe. Yep, what's the name of this game? Yes, we play scorecard whack-a-mole. So the idea here is you look at your scorecard, at least from our perspective from a marketing uh, kind of lens, we look at this and we say, this number is great, this number is great, this number sucks. Let's go get this number, right? And you work on this number until it doesn't suck anymore. And so we play whack-a-mole. Um, this is not my kid. I wish that, that would be great if this is my kid, but this is not. But um, yeah, and so this is like a, a, a simple way to look at the whole of your marketing world and just say, let's do the one thing that's the worst right now. And we'll talk about leverage in a minute because that's really what this is. It's like, what's the absolute worst thing that we can affect that will make a big difference in our business? So what, right? So like, yeah, that sounds great. And so the so what is that your metrics should, should guide your growth strategy. And so I, I think this slide sounds like really obvious, but I hope that we can kind of like shed some more light on what this looks like from a practical perspective in a minute. So let's be Lumberg, right, and talk about some TPS reports. And so this is where the audience participation comes in. Uh, so we're a SaaS business doing 10,000 a month, and we have an average revenue per user of 50 bucks, which I'm very jealous of. Um, and so let's consider a couple of scenarios. Um, so this is the first scenario. I'll give everyone a minute to digest this, uh, the CC at sign-up. So they're requiring credit card at sign-up, which Rob talked about yesterday is the vast minority, I guess. Um, so looking at this, I think this is a pretty typical like early stage SaaS application. What is the mole that we all want to whack? Yep. So the number here that we like to look for is like 2% is awesome, 1% is okay, this is not good, right? So you're doing a fair amount of work maybe to get 2,500 visitors a month. Almost nobody's turning into a, a trial, trial customer or a trial trialer. Um, and then, then the rest of it is, is, I think, pretty good. The one that's really sweet here is LTV of almost a thousand bucks. That's awesome. Um, so let's look at scenario two. Also with credit card at sign up, what's the mole we want to whack here? Yep, 10% churn. You replace all of your customers every 10 months. Yeah, <laughs> you have anxiety just thinking about it, right? Um, what's that? Fresh energy, right? It's after lunch on the first day, on the second day, yep, we got some energy. And so it leads us to like our rule of thumb, right? Rule of thumbs are very uh, flexible things, but this is like my rule of thumb, and I, I don't know, we'll see if anybody agrees with it. 
if your child to pay conversion ratio is greater than 35% with credit card up front, or without credit card if it's greater than 15%, and your revenue churn is less than 6%, then you have just a top of funnel, you need more people on your website. Uh, if it's worse than that, you need to focus on retention, and you probably don't have product market fit. Everybody cool with this? Right, like Steli, this is yes, this is no, right? Okay. Uh, I, this is what we go by, um, and we are solidly in the top category up here right now. We need just more people in our world. So that's a pretty cool place to be. If you're a developer, your product is awesome. Your messaging on site aligns with that, and the people that are signing up are expecting to get the value that they get. So uh, moving on to no credit card at sign up, which is where we are cast us now. Uh, we don't have 100,000 website visitors a month, that, or 10,000 that would be. Oh no, we do have 10,000. We don't have 100,000. Uh, so, so where's the kind of ugly mole here that we need to whack? Yep, 6%. Uh, this is rough, right? You're getting a whole bunch of people onto your site, they're starting a trial, and they're saying, your thing is horrible. <laughs> I'm never gonna pay you money. It's also like Rob talked about yesterday, the onus is on you and you don't have credit card up front to prove the value of your product to those trialers. Uh, and this is, this is something we're getting used to at Castos right now. We required credit card up front for the first two and a half years. So a lot of the onus is on in marketing to say, hey, our thing is so cool, great, and they put the credit card in and they just convert after two weeks. Now, the onus is on us to, to convert those people uh, during the trial period. How about the last scenario here? Also, no credit card up front. So the rest of this is great, right? Visitor to trial, trial to paid, churn. Eh, I hate your churn, right? 6% okay, right? It depends, but I think 6% is okay. And at this point, this is rule of thumb number two, and all the developers in the room, which is like almost everybody is gonna hate the rest of the talk now, because uh, if you have less than, and 30,000 is kind of an amb ambiguous number, um, but if you don't have a ton of traffic to your site and the rest of your business is pretty good, then you just need more traffic. Um, and this is, this, is a, this is a really tough thing for all of us to, really grok and accept because it's an emotional thing to sell or embrace the marketing of your business. What we're talking about is leverage, right? Our committee's lever. This is, we want to look for the single thing. We can turn this or lever this and it moves a huge amount of business for us in the end. It's not, kind of going back a couple of slides, it's not getting our visitor to trial ratio to 1.75%, right? That's gonna be a couple hundred bucks a month, but what if you tripled your website traffic? That's some cheddar, right? And so that's what we're gonna talk about kind of for the rest of this, and this is, this is like a tough thing, and even for me, I'm not a developer, I'm a marketer. I should be, because I'm not a developer. I have to be a sales and marketing guy, but we're all scared to do marketing and to really dive in and embrace the fact that we need to sell our stuff. Um, within the tiny seed cohort, I think it's okay to talk about this, guys. Like, uh, it is absolutely the one thing that everybody struggles with, right? Ten companies of successful multi-time founders, all of us every week are talking about how we can get more customers. Very, very few of us are talking about how can we build a thing that's more cool and eh, maybe a little bit of design or something like that. But it all, you know, a lot of that stuff ultimately goes to how can I do better at sales and marketing? Because we're all scared of it. Um, this is, <laughs> this is it, right? Like, uh, because the, the, the fear is I can go build a thing and all of you guys can go build a thing that's really great, right? But there's a decent chance that all of us could, or many of us could, could dedicate ourselves to marketing and it fail, right? And then you've said, oh, I, <laughs> I went all in on this thing and I, I couldn't pull it off. And that's rough, like emotionally, that's really rough. Um, and so this is like rule of thumb number zero, I guess, right? Is that all the developers in here, and even me, I'm not a developer, but I find myself falling into this trap a lot, is that I lean on our development team, right? Instead of me going out and doing more marketing and figuring that part of the business out, I say, man, if we had this thing, we'd be set, guys, you know? Uh, how, when can we release this feature? When, how about this integration? And that is not the problem, right? The problem, like, if the rest of our SaaS metrics is good, and that's what this assumes, if the rest of our SaaS metrics are good, 
then we just need more customers, right? And the product will not solve that. There, I think, are exceptions where like the product sells itself and all that, and those people are not at this conference, right? They're on those boats out there. Um, <laughs> but for the majority of us, we have to figure out how to sell our product easier and better, and that's what we'll talk about kind of for the rest of our time. Um, and, and so going back to like acquisition metrics, so really top of funnel, if you will, stuff, um, your acquisition metrics and where that kind of ugly mole is should dictate how, when, and where you talk to your customers. Um, so who has heard of Eugene Schwartz? Three, three, cool, couple, yeah. So Eugene Schwartz, I think of him as like, he is the big guy from Mad Men, right? Like he's an old school direct response marketer and advertiser, right? Uh, and so Eugene Schwartz wrote this book that's now out of print and like to get it it's like 600 bucks on Amazon or something. And he talks about the five stages of a customer journey. And so we'll kind of talk about the customer journey and how we all can and do apply it to acquiring more customers and doing so in a really um, appropriate way for those customers and so things that make a lot of sense to them. Uh, and so I have to give credit where credit is due. This concept was introduced to me by one of the Tiny Seed mentors, Taylor Hendrickson. Um, so I love that Taylor's like uh, avatar photo is of him holding a beer. It's cool. Um, Taylor lives in Hood River, Oregon, where they have some fantastic beer. Um, and Taylor runs a marketing agency that helps SaaS businesses and e-commerce stores with exactly this thing. So he's like the perfect person to talk about it. Maybe he should be here talking instead of me, but and so here's kind of the gist of, it doesn't show up great with the white font, um, the, the five phases of a customer journey. And it starts kind of from the bottom and goes up. Uh, and, and the bottom is a place you don't want to be, right? Uh, the bottom is a place where you're creating the, the market or you're creating the product in this market. And people are completely unaware that they have a problem or that there's a solution to it or that there's a product that, that solves you know, the, that need that they have. Uh, and, and if you find yourself down here, you have a long road ahead of you. You have a, product, a problem of educating the market on the problem and that there's a solution and that there's a product that fulfills what that solution needs to be and that your product is the best one and then they have to buy, right? So you have to go all the way up here. Some folks are problem aware and we'll talk, I'll give a couple of examples of just like specifically kind of where some people are and how they attack this. Um, some people are problem aware, so they're like, I need a podcast hosting platform. Cool, because I need to host my file somewhere. That's fair. So then you have to walk these folks from there's a problem to there's a solution to your solution, your product, is the best one for them, and then kind of from there and there. So there's some people that say, I need a CRM to, to make my sales team more effective. Cool, close.io, close.com. Um, and then product aware is I'm going to choose mixed panel or amplitude. And then that gets tough, right? And so the, I think the, the idea with some of this is that the higher up you get in this, the more difficult a lot of the marketing is because you are, are focused on kind of smaller things. So it might features and this and that and uh, rebates and discount codes and things like that uh, as, as, as you get up higher into this. And we'll talk a little bit more about some strategy around how you might think about entering this spectrum because people exist all along the spectrum and where you choose to enter and talk to your customers in this spectrum talks about how, like what kind of marketing you do and how long you might expect that, that some of this marketing takes. So a few examples. So we're a podcast hosting platform. We have a couple of different, different customer personas. Some of them are existing podcasters like myself that might move from another tool like SoundCloud onto a tool like Castos. That's one type of customer persona. We would talk to them in a different way than we would talk to new podcasters, right? New podcasters come in, I laugh because, I mean, it's, it's an unenviable position because podcasting is really popular but kind of complex. It's not like, oh, you spend a WordPress and you do a blog post and it goes into the world. Like, there's a lot to podcasting. So a lot of people come in and say, I have no effing idea how to do any of this, right? We have a lot of people that come into that. And that's cool because we can add a lot of value by providing a ton of content around this, right? And that's what we do. And so here's a... A, a, a sample of like maybe what a, a funnel or a customer journey would go, look like is like we have this huge how to start a podcast blog post, right? Uh, and so a lot of people come to it organically. Some people come to it from ads that we run, and they say, "Wow, this is a really cool, uh, this is a really cool blog post." Uh, you know, Castos probably those guys know what they're talking about. 
Uh, then maybe they sign up for an email course. We have like a you know, 20 day how to start a podcast email course. That's cool. And by the end of it, uh, we pitch this thing called Office Hours, which is a live webinar we run every week where we answer questions about podcasters. So all this stuff is the same, right? It's talking to the same person at the same point in their journey with the same topic and in trying to answer and solve the same problem. And the offer is, you know, hey, if you're part of this email course, here's a coupon code to, to sign up, right? So, Paul, I didn't ask your permission to, to do this. <laughs> so Less Accounting is uh, one of the tiny seed companies. I know Paul really well. We talk every week. Uh, and so Paul is, uh, you know, Less Accounting is uh, accounting software for small businesses. And their problem is, I want to do my accounting, but it's a pain, and I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, and I want it to be right. And so a sample kind of uh, customer journey for, for Less Accounting and for Paul could be something like drive traffic to... Uh, he flipped their uh, to a case study from one of his existing customers. Talks about how great less accounting is and how it saves them a ton of time every week and all this kind of stuff. Maybe then it's like, hey, if you want to see more about less accounting, click here to view this demo where Paul would get on a call with them and walk them through it. Uh, and then maybe you would have a service about like, hey, I'm going to solve this thing for you by making it super easy. I'm just going to get all your books set up on your on this platform for you, or, or you know, use automated tools to make this easier for them. So we all heard from Steli earlier. Everybody knows what Close is? Close is a CRM? Yep. Uh, and so I think the, the customer persona here would be something like sales managers or directors or founders who want to make their sales teams more productive, but also for them to have insights into what those people are doing. So I manage a salesperson now, and what the deal flow and the pipeline looks like is, is a big question I have as, as a founder. Uh, and so this is an interesting one that, that I think we'll spend some time talking about because Steli is a really savvy guy, right? Everybody heard him talk this morning. Um, is Steli here still? Okay. Um, so they write a metric ton of content around how to do sales better. And so Steli kind of has dispelled some of this myth because you would consider that a lot of people looking for a CRM like Close are product aware, right? They know they need a tool to make their salespeople sell better and for the management team to have visibility into this, right? But I think what Steli has seen is that that's a crappy place to be, right? Because then you're competing directly against Pipedrive and Salesforce and the 8,000 other people in his space, right? And nobody wants to do that. Is anybody in like a super, in a super competitive space? Anybody else in a super competitive space? Yeah. Do you try to attract and convert people really far down in the funnel and say, hey, we have this feature that is better than everyone else? Yeah, you do? Is it going well? Yeah, it sounds like it's going well. That's cool. Yep, yep, cool. So that's a really good approach. That's a really good approach. To, to go to the whole market, I think, would be challenging, right? And so that's probably why you haven't done it, is to say, like, Close and Pipedrive and Salesforce and all this basically do the same thing, right? So then coming into folks that are just product aware and trying to sell them on your thing versus everyone else's thing is, is tough skating. So, so I think what Steli has done, again, because he's a really savvy guy, is he's kind of gone up the, the ladder, if you will, from here. And this is, that I, I, this is kind of where will leave things a little bit is there's not an answer to where you should talk to your customers. You should talk to them all the way through the spectrum, um, but you should talk to them the place that's the, the easiest and best for you, and, and maybe the place where your metrics tell you that, that you can provide the most value. And so Steli is down here, right? And so like the only way he can provide a, a movable incentive for people is to lower his price or something that I know he would never do. And so what he's chosen to do is to be a thought leader in the space and go all the way up here, or maybe even here, I would, I would argue, right? And so Steli and a lot of the really best brands we know play all the way up in the problem aware or the unaware side of the spectrum and then follow their customers or their customers follow them all the way through until they're ready to buy. And I think this is kind of the classic content marketing inbound approach that we see a lot of folks do. And I bring this up, not that like I think content marketing is the only way to go or the way you should go, because I think there are definitely people that can only focus further down in the customer journey stage of things. And talking about like cold email, like you can do cold email and just sell people uh, like, like the folks from Gather are doing. And that's cool, and if you can do that, 
like a lot of us are envious, right? Because you have a relatively straightforward, not simple, but a relatively straightforward thing to do. Like you have a tool, you can let folks know about it and, and convert them to, to trialing and paying customers, hopefully. But if you think that is too hard to do or you think you can't do that effectively at scale, then you have to move up the, up the spectrum here to get folks earlier on in their, their journey as, as you know, uh, someone who's evaluating you, uh, you as a solution or your market uh, and hopefully becoming a customer in the end. Is this cool, everybody? Yeah? Right on. Cool, thank you. Uh, and so, yeah, I think this is, uh, this is, this is kind of like where we wrap up and saying, like, we should let our metrics guide where we focus our energy. And then I, I think for the most folks in this room, and myself included, like, you built a good product. And so, like, to, to as, as much as you can kind of devote yourself to, to marketing and understanding this customer journey and approaching and talking to people at the appropriate point in their, in their journey as a buyer. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's everything for me. Uh, if folks want to grab the slides from this, you can do it at this bit.ly link. Um, I'm sure Mike and Rob will send this stuff out later. Um, would love to answer any questions anybody has. Thank you very much.